Hello, I'm with Eric Weinstein. He is a research fellow at the Mathematical Institute at uh, Oxford. Uh, he is also a grantee uh, with INIT. Eric, uh, thanks for agreeing to be uh, interviewed by us today. Well, thanks, Marshall, for having me. Um, you have a very interesting story um, because, unlike a lot of people, you didn't come into the profession as a, as a pure economist. Uh, in fact, you have a background as a mathematician and, and a physics major, if I'm not mistaken. I've actually never taken a class in economics. So, uh, in, in, in part, that has its uh, advantages and disadvantages, but it does give you a perspective uh, which is not determined by the usual introductory economics. And um, one of the interesting aspects of your work is that uh, for many years uh, you didn't take the profession seriously in the sense that you said um, it's, uh, it, it approaches mathematics from a very simplistic uh, point of view. And I think that's ironic because, of course, one of the criticisms uh, that's often made of classical mainstream economics is that, that it's become overly mathematized. So I was wondering what your perspective is on that. Hmm. Well, I, I think that there is something to saying that it's been over, overly mathematized. I think that there are a large number of people with uh, bachelor's or master's degrees in mathematics who go into economics and who carry a certain amount of the formalism, um, but it is often lacking much of the elegance uh, that comes from pure mathematics or mathematical physics. But more to the point, the, the concern is uh, generally held across the sciences, the hard sciences, that the problems of economics are usually so severe uh, that it's very unlikely uh, that economic problems of any complexity would yield uh, to the mathematical techniques that have been developed. And so, uh, large numbers of mathematicians and physicists hold the point of view that economics um, is an enterprise which is in some sense uh, likely to be doomed because it's simply too hard, whereas math and physics are comparatively easy. And you used to share that view to some extent, but you've obviously changed your mind because you have done a lot more work in the economics area, area even though you're not an economist. So what, uh, can you just give me a little bit about the information about the evolution of your own thinking on this? Sure. I think that um, in part, you have to appreciate that, the ma that what is intriguing about economics is the field that could be more than the field that is. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, there's a certain collection of insights from within economics that would appeal to most uh, people of a mathematical or physical bent, uh, which are non-trivial insights um, that really do elucidate some part uh, of the human condition. For example, Arrow's impossibility theorem or Coase's theorem uh, on securitization of rights or uh, the law of comparative advantage. So there's some collection of insights uh, that come out of economics that if they're put in front of a mathematician or physicist, uh, most probably that person would respond positively uh, to, to that subset of insights. And I think that uh, as those insights were put in front of me, in particular, Coase's theorem, which I got wrong and I guessed wrong about uh, from its initial description, I had to admit that uh, it was uh, beautiful and elegant in much the same terms that uh, mathematics and physics is beautiful and elegant. And, and in fact, uh, you have taken uh, some fairly complex economic problems. I mean, they're, they're, they're seemingly simple measures, for example, like consumer price inflation. But instead of using traditional um, economic tools, you in fact uh, and your uh, co-author, Pia Mullaney, uh, uh, used um, gauge theory to try to um, uh, derive a solution to the so-called problem of consumer price inflation, how we calculate a whole bunch of different variables together. Do you want to describe that process for the, the non-mathematical layman as easily as you can? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, this is actually the consumer price aspect to the gauge theory work is really the first application of an entire program. Uh, Sometime in the mid-1970s, there was an explosion uh, in mathematical physics. Mathematics and physics had gone separate directions since the beginning of the 20th century. And it wasn't until um, Jim Simons, now a famous hedge fund manager, uh, and C.N. Yang, the, uh, you know, possibly the greatest living theoretical physicist, uh, started talking at a seminar in Stony Brook that they realized that both fields had developed a common language and a common set of constructs. 
And at that point, there was uh, a dictionary to be able to go back and forth called the Wu Yang Dictionary. And mm -hmm. that created uh, a renaissance in mathematical physics because everything that had been understood in differential geometry now could be used in theoretical physics and conversely with particle theory and differential geometry. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating is, is that economics has exactly the same structure, but for whatever reasons, because the field has been slow to recognize it, uh, we now have a Rosetta Stone with three different languages uh, and an ability to port tools and techniques back and forth between uh, any pair of fields. So at some point, we would hope in the near future, all sorts of mathematicians and physicists who had never previously taken an interest in economics would suddenly find that they were able to contribute at a surprising level because of the beauty of this particular toolkit. Now what... Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. What this is, is a reinvention of the calculus. So if you think about the marginal revolution originally as being the introduction of the differential calculus formally into economic theory, every time a different version of the differential calculus has penetrated uh, into economic theory, whether that's the stochastic differential calculus of Black-Scholes theory uh, or linear programming or what have you, um, you get a revolution of sorts. Gauge theory is probably the most sophisticated form of the differential calculus uh, that we've ever needed to invent. And the fact that economic theory forms a natural gauge theory um, is really a stunning discovery which allows uh, a wealth of possibilities which have not yet been explored. And yet, um, uh, and you know this from your own sad personal experience, um, there is often resistance to taking um, 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 these sophisticated tools and applying them towards economics, not just for, in terms of um, elucidating the truth, but um, as we know, um, politics uh, can sometimes get in the way. And um, I guess saying that uh, economics is, uh, is uh, po politically content-free is a bit like saying you can do uh, math without uh, using numbers. <laughs> Well, yes, I, I think that you have to, uh, and perhaps this is a bit harsh, but if you imagine some period of time when astronomy and astrology are housed in the same department, yeah. or chemistry and alchemy uh, uh, sit side by side at a university, such is the situation currently with economic theory. There is a portion of the field uh, which seeks to return dependable conclusions to those uh, who are its patrons, and there's another portion of the field which is fundamentally focused on getting things right and trying to understand uh, markets, human behavior, and the world that we see. Uh, I don't think that there's so much of a difficulty penetrating uh, the part of the field that behaves much like a science. Um, but the problem is, is that that's not the dominant part of the field as we've yeah. seen. Yeah, that's right. And, and the example, uh, to, just so, so people are, are aware, is uh, that uh, you and, and Pia had an experience where you actually took your insight about gauge theory, applied it to the CPI, and thought, this is going to be an extraordinarily uh, helpful way to get a, a true calculation of, uh, of, of cons uh, consumer price index and, and, and inflation. And of course, on the other side of that, um, there was a, 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 a commission being set up, the Boston Commission, uh, which was um, also set up ostensibly to try to refine the measurements of uh, consumer price inflation. Although, as we now know from uh, history, that uh, in fact um, there was a conclusion, a political conclusion made where uh, Senators Packwood and Moynihan wished to derive about a, a, a trillion dollars worth of savings. And uh, because they felt they couldn't do that politically, they said, well, let's try to um, get a, a calculation of CPI done, uh, which will give us those savings. And that's what effectively became the Boston Commission. Right. So this was a bit of a surprise, because we thought we had the situation that was probably the best of all possible worlds. Right. We were contributing uh, not only a solution to an unsolved problem, but a problem that had been claimed to be insoluble, Fisher and Shell in the early 1970s had claimed that it was impossible to do um, Conus, uh, Las Pierre's Conus cost of living theory using changing tastes unless uh, one used a bizarre interpretation that they offered. And the claim was is that it was mathematically too difficult to have uh, intersecting uh, in different surfaces um, because of the transitivity uh, problem uh, from the tests of Fisher. So we actually found that that was an erroneous conclusion and that we were able to solve this problem and come up with a technique that's conjecturally unique. And this was at exactly the same time 
that the Boston Commission was formed ostensibly on the surface to move from a fixed basket notion of CPI to a cost of living measure whereby instead of fixing the basket, we would fix the level of uh, ordinal utility. However, uh, what we didn't know was that the uh, closeted purpose of this was in fact to raise taxes and to decrease benefits without a political cost to be paid for touching the so-called third rail. Mm -hmm. And so the idea would be to get uh, blue chip economists to uh, bless a reduction in CPI and therefore tax brackets that were being indexed as well as let's say social security payments. Um, both of those would go in the direction to put more money in government coffers. And uh, so effectively, we ended up making a deposit at the bank on the very day it was being robbed. <laughs> and I, I like this. Oh, I don't like the story. It's a very sad story. But, but I, it's, it's a good story in terms of uh, illustrating precisely that, that tension, you say, because uh, there is obviously a school, a predominant school of economics, which, you know, they have certain political conclusions that they uh, wish to reach or certain, uh, a certain ideology that they wish to sustain. And they use the, the, the discipline for that purpose, as opposed to what we're trying to do at INET, uh, which which is, uh, of course, to, to take it off in a different direction and, and, and move it towards some sort of genuinely new economic thinking, which does elucidate truth or something a little bit more accurately, uh, close to approximating reality. Yeah, I, I, I think it's important to realize what actually occurred is slightly different than, than what most people think the problem usually is in economics. This was not the, the issue that there was a group that had become overly wedded to a particular point of view. This was a group. Uh, that simply was willing to uh, do the bidding of power uh, on a coin-operated basis so far as we can make out. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, it wasn't a question of old economic thinking and new economic thinking. It was a question of pliable economic thinking versus actual mm -hmm. insight. Yeah, yeah. And let me uh, uh, ask you something else. The, one of the uh, common critiques, as I said, made about the economics profession is that it has become overly mathematized, that finance has become overly mathematized, um, that you've got set, effectively got a situation where, you know, kids are playing with Semtex and uh, they're blowing things up and, and we really have to go back to a more simplified structure. And so when people like you uh, enter the profession, there's a feeling that, oh my God, we're getting yet more of these uh, rocket scientists getting involved in this and there's going to be even more disasters. How do you respond to something like that? Uh, with great delicacy. <laughs> the issue is that um, if you take... The issue is not whether there's too much mathematics or too little mathematics. It's do you have the right kind of mathematics? And the kind of mathematics that we're interested in uh, has certain properties that are, in fact, um, very beneficial for trying to lock out the kind of game playing uh, that is so common within the profession. So there, if you think about uh, an interoperable system like Lego, the pieces fit together in a particularly beautiful way. Mm -hmm. The kind of elegant mathematics that we're dealing with is not so easily uh, disturbed and uh, ruined by special pleading. It has an internal consistency. It's really not there to obfuscate. It's much more elegant. It's much easier to read once you understand the language. Mm -hmm. And so the issue is that you're at a sort of halfway point uh, with mathematics and economics. You haven't yet broken through to the point where uh, the mathematics makes things spare, elegant, and beautiful. Once upon a time, Maxwell's equations were probably four complicated partial differential equations. Mm -hmm. The current version is one simple, easy to remember equation. Why is that? It's because gauge theory, in this case, uh, simplified the system so that it became completely conceptual rather than highly technical with lots of terms and minus and plus signs to remember. So I think it's important to understand that the fear people have that more mathematics uh, means more complicated mathematics is entirely erroneous. Let me ask you one final point. Um, we know we're called the Institute for New Economic Thinking and uh, uh, we're trying to embrace new economic thinking. What does that mean to you and what do you think we have to do to, to ensure that we're true to our mandate? It's a great question. Um, I think INET has done a sensational job, particularly with uh, Rob Johnson's vision and uh, brilliant insights uh, of George Soros, and I'd love to talk about how Soros's theory of reflexivity 
fits with this. Um, the credibility has been built. A fantastic advisory board has been assembled. But now the problem is, is that you have to move from the period of coming out of the closet that you're dissatisfied with current thinking. And you have to make very bold and judicious choices of what re represents new economic thinking. It can't be a series of one-off complaints, little observations. It has to be a body of theory that has a kind of consistency. The reason that new economic thinking has not been successful with the fighting the uh, neoclassical toolkit is that the neoclassical toolkit has this feature that it is interoperable. And so you can always play with the Lego uh, to get to some sort of an approach. What we're trying to do in this case is provide a superset of the techniques that have been found previously. In other words, everything we're doing is backwards compatible, but it is much more elegant, much more powerful, and it allows us to remove the artificial assumptions. So one of the things that we think is important is to recognize that the problem wasn't so much the mathematics or physics envy or what have you, but the completely bizarre nature of the artificial assumptions that are used to make sure that certain sorts of conclusions can be reached. For example, that certain solutions are unique or are path independent. Mm -hmm. When you can clearly see that many solutions are not unique, are path, in, are path dependent, and that uncertainty is a large part of the theory. So the point is, is that you have to be willing to reach certain conclusions which have previously been seen as uh, diluting the political influence and power of the profession. If markets will return uh, one of many conclusions, it's not guaranteed to be optimal and it can't be said to be happening uh, with some high degree of confidence. The question is, uh, are economists comfortable recognizing the limits of their own models? Physicists have learned how not to extract certain answers which are erroneous through a process known as renormalization theory. Will economists uh, be satisfied if their models return certain numbers which they then are forced to say are not in fact accurate. So we need a little bit more of the, uh, the physicist's uh, humility, I think is a fair way to put it. Actually. I've never noticed physicists to be humble, but I believe that the <laughs> physical world has disciplined them to yep. recognize that if they don't wish to look foolish, uh, it's best to learn how to partition their questions so that they ask only the questions that are robust to the errors within any, any given theory. As opposed to trying to exclude the real world as we try to often do in the economics profession. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. And yeah. I think that one of the one of the things that I'd love to get back to is that um, I think that George Soros's theory of reflexivity has not been taken seriously because we haven't had the mathematics to incorporate it within the standard canon. If you think about what he's saying, it's no question that agents move markets. But what he's saying is, is that markets move the minds of agents. Now you have to ask yourself the question, what is the mathematics of moving a mind? If advertising pushes our minds, if our fellow consumers influence our decisions, if tastes are not given, how do we encode that mathematically? In fact, um, what we're doing in gauge theory uh, is exactly along these lines. By allowing minds to become dynamic and allowing markets to be able to push on them, you have uh, really a very inviting opportunity to start thinking about a uh, model in which uh, hearts and minds move endogenously in response to market forces that they, in fact, uh, re-influence in a continuous cycle. And I think at that point we're just going to have to leave it. That's a great way to end it. But uh, thanks a lot for uh, spending the time with me. This has been fascinating. Marshall, thanks. thanks for having me. It was great.